AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action puts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Rohit Nambishan. Rohit is the president and co-founder of Lockavant. Rohit, welcome to the show. Thank you, JP. Happy to be here. Rohit, so let's start with a little bit of background of yourself, um, how you first got involved in technology, some of the roles you held along the way, talking us through your career, leading up to your current role here as head of Lockavant. So... I started out in neuroscience research. I was a neuroscientist for about 10 years. I worked in academic and clinical oriented research. Um, In the latter half of my tenure as a neuroscientist, I focused on applied or computational neuroscience. That is biomimetic robotics, neural networks, computer vision, things that are generally classified under artificial intelligence today. Um, After my tenure as a neuroscientist, I jumped into a role in pharma. I spent uh, about four to five years at Novartis working on the personalized medicine side, developing genetic assays that stratify patient populations to identify the right therapy for the right patient or the right patient for the right therapy. Um, And I also worked on the oncology global development and oncology commercial commercial development um, areas to get a better understanding of drug development and commercialization and the pipelines and the processes they're in. Um, Through that, I got very interested in data flows and how data actually is utilized in other domains of healthcare, such as health IT, to optimize products and to, and to, for the purposes of analysis and analytics. Um, And I, I, I jumped out of, after a short stint in MIT in, in the management degree, I jumped into health IT specifically to understand how data pipes are created and how to actually aggregate and manage that data for the purposes of insight generation. And through that, I spent a, a few different uh, roles um, I, developing large scale products for att- attesting for meaningful use, which is an initiative that's now defunct, but was the idea was to better leverage electronic health records and different types of technologies to connect patients and physicians and healthcare staff um, more virtually and more in real time. So I did that for a number of years, a couple of years developing systems for the VA health system nationwide, Kaiser and Geisinger health systems. And at that point, I decided to shift my, my focus a little bit. Now that I learned a little bit more about data flows and how healthcare data flows and the regulations and how to productionalize and use that data for analytics and insights, I jumped into uh, a number of different roles in startup companies focused primarily on data products and data analytics products towards life science companies and payers. So in the life sciences, both commercial analytics, understanding um, exactly how to optimize sales and marketing initiatives using data and healthcare data in a, in a meaningful manner, as well as on the payer side, I focused on using analytics, combining multiple different types of healthcare data, claims, lab data, um, especially pharmacy data, et cetera, to drive insights on in how best to manage populations of patients for care management and risk management for health insurers and payers. Um, After a number of those stints in different areas of healthcare, I I joined a company called Royvant. Royvant is best known for launching a number of healthcare companies, more specifically biotechnology companies. And they had launched, I think when I got there, about 11 different biotechnology companies. And obviously uh, developing many different therapeutics uh, across a suite of different companies um, we we very quickly learned that there was just a number of challenges in the drug development space associated with, you know, the more human-oriented, laborious, process-driven methods, et cetera. In fact, I think that in a lot of ways, drug development still hasn't progressed beyond, you know, the, the 19, early 1990s in terms of technology. And so we thought that if we had, if we're going to do this systematically, we need to change the way it's done. 
And so we did a lot of different iterations with technology um, across a number of drug development initiatives across drug and family of companies. And through that process, we identified a number of common themes and common needs amongst the drug development teams, specifically in the operational side of drug development, that is the actual elements of administering clinical trials and the processes to actually ensure that a trial is being developed in accordance with a protocol or the rule set of how the drug is defined to be developed. And actually that, that work culminated in the company that I co-founded with the Roy Van Sciences um, called Locavant. And right now I'm leading Locavant. Locavant is a, I would say a product company in healthcare, which is hard enough to do. But I will say more than that, it is a product company whose substrate is data science and data analytics focused on really reimagining and transforming the ways that trials are administered through the use of AI. Rohit, well, thank you for the background. Um, a very interesting taking us through your journey in, in, in computational neuroscience right the way into a, a very tech-focused role within healthcare. Um, so for people familiar w- with uh, healthcare and health tech, uh, Roy Avant, our household name, well-known brand, really industry leaders. Uh, everyone's watching with great interest uh, this newly formed Lock Avant. But for people listening who are maybe not as familiar with, with healthcare technology, could you sort of paint a picture of the the traditional ways that healthcare and, and, and pharma companies were utilizing their data uh, to lead us into why Lockavant is such a unique offering and what you guys are trying to do to change the, the way this industry works? Sure, I'm happy to address that. Um, I guess the best way to say this is that If you think about it at its core, a clinical trial is ostensibly a data collection exercise. You're collecting a number of data sources from the patients, from the sites, et cetera, to determine whether a therapy is safe and effective to treat a specific cohort of patients, right? So one would think that data should be leveraged along the way in so many different manners. But when you look at the actual stats you realize quickly that's not the case. So I'll say a fairly provocative statement and I'll back that up with some data of my own at this point that we've collected. The first is that clinical trials, the provocative statement, clinical trials are broken. Bringing one therapy on average, it takes 10 years and costs on average $2.6 billion to, to develop and attain market approval. And then monitoring, which is the act of ensuring that a trial is conducted in accordance with its protocol, which one would think would be data-driven as well, that can comprise almost 50% of a single trial cost. And 72% of clinical trials run behind schedule. And each day a trial is behind schedule, it costs 600,000 to 8 million a day. That does not seem like a very optimized set of processes. When we dig a little deeper, we realize that much of this, a significant source of the delays, the in timelines, the increased costs, and you know, the frankly, the failures of, of trials after spending so much money on developing a drug or even doing the research and then moving into development, is caused by operational issues. And this should never be the case. Uh, clinical risk, which is exactly what a trial is identifying, whether a therapy is safe and effective at treating a population, that's enough risk. But operational risks, you know, such as protocol noncompliance, they, you know, when you're running the trial, usually you should be running the trial in all sites in accordance with what the trial, how the trial is supposed to be administered as defined by a protocol that's stated at the outset of the trial planning process. And when there are deviations from that process, you put the trial at risk. You know, for example, the data that's deviant, or the data that's being collected that's not in accordance with the protocol, you know, either needs to be categorized and to be figured out whether it's actually a severe deviation or it's a minor deviation. And those severe deviations oftentimes will lead to discounting data. And obviously, if you discount data, you know, you have to replace that data, or if enough data has to be discounted. Um, and by the way, if you discount data and you replace that data, that takes more time to do that, and time equals money. And if you have a lot of data that needs to be discounted, then you probably can't submit and it's failing the trial. So we see that protocol noncompliance is a major issue. Um, and 
if you think about it, just to add a little bit more color to this, the general process and regulatory submission, regulatory submission to the FDA or EMA or whatever regulatory body, is say what you do, do what you say. And monitoring, as I mentioned before, is the practice of ensuring that you do what you say you do, right? And how that's done right now, the, the, the policing of the trials, so to speak, it's teams of people reviewing thousands of incoming data attributes on a weekly basis data silos to focus teams on analysis of specific data types because they can look at everything. And then manual integration of data sets leading to you know, cycles of data reconciliation. So that is a large, large problem leading to a lot of the issues associated with, you know, the, 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 that I aforementioned, the problem, the, you know, the delays, the, the, the challenges in terms of the amount of cost to develop a therapy on average, et cetera. What we've done differently here at Locavent is we've recognized that data should be interrogated every day in the process of a trial, not just near the end when there's not much that can be done about it, and not even you know, a month after the data is collected because the issues that you identify can compound and create such severe catastrophic issues over a period of time that you can't mitigate them. So our view is that's be able to automatically ingest data from many disparate crowd data sources and interrogate that data on a daily basis to identify in an automatic way, automatic way to identify non-compliance of the protocol, right? And that sounds fairly straightforward to say, but even just that ingestion of data from disparate sources, there could be a clinical data source that, you know, uh, that five different clinical data sources that have completely different schemas. And so to map those schemas together requires a lot of work. If you were going to do that manually, you'd result in the process that we have today that creates a lot of the problems. We've specifically taken a number of machine learning approaches, clustering based algorithms, access, uh, human in the loop process, assistive processing, to actually scale the process of ingesting and, and mapping data into a canonical schema thereby making it available for analysis. So that allows us to do that on a daily basis. Now, we also have a risk model that's a white box, white box risk model. And why I say white box is that we're in a regulated environment. I've spent a lot of years developing black box models. And while they can be powerful in terms of their predictive capabilities, you don't really know why they predicted a, a particular output. And that just doesn't fly oftentimes in a highly regulated environment. And so what we've done is we made it very traceable. It's a learning model that's very traceable that comes up with a risk score. And that risk score is derived by three different types of composites, risk to timeline, risk to budget, and risk to quality of the study, or what we call submission quality, right? Submittability. And so we drive it from those particular risks, and we look at all the canonicalized data elements and understand through ensemble models how different groupings of those canonical data elements will index against risk to timeline, risk to budget, and risk to quality. And that, so in doing so, we can start to predict risks before they, or issues before they happen, and definitely in real time, but in many ways before they happen, based on training that model on previous you know, thousands of other trials worth of data that we've already done. It's almost hard to understate the significance of this advancement when you think about the, from a, any way you want to measure it, whether it be dollars saved, speed of trials, effectiveness of trials, accuracy of trials. In, in every area, this, what you're trying to do for your clients is, is sort of game changing how clinical trials will run. If you've only got to look at the the current time we live in with, with COVID and, and global lockdowns, you know, many clinical trials have, have ground to a halt because the, the studies have just stopped based on access to patients. So technology like this is, is more important than ever. And I think once we come out of the post-COVID world, we're, we're going to see, you know, if they haven't already, every, every major pharma company and biotech is going to be leaning more towards technology to, to solve some of those problems you mentioned. Um, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about the specific challenges that you face working within healthcare data, because you mentioned already, one, the regulation standards are, are of the, the highest level, so it's not like innovation in any other form of technology. And second, uh, access to data, and a lot of the data that you're, you're looking at is, is incredibly complex, often... Um, often very disjointed and so to pull that all together requires you know a really 
a really strategic focus with you know data science and, and, and AI and machine learning playing a huge point. So could you, uh, from a from a high level, just give us some insight as some of the unique problems that you guys are having to solve in order to to accomplish your goals? Well, let's start on the regulation piece. Personal health information cannot be shared, right? And so in order to actually ingest patient level data, you have to tokenize it or hash it or de-identify it is the best, best word I could think about for this, right? So we've worked with different groups that do that, like our sister company, Databand, for example, that's been able to help us with that. And in some cases, when it's not an entirely complex um, and, and we're doing a specific trial for you know, a smaller company, we can just use, we can have them blind the patient data for us at the outset. Um, there is a number of other considerations associated with California Privacy Act and, you know, GDPR and things in terms of things beyond patient health information or personal, personal health information, such as, um, I would say, you know, PII, personal, personal identifiable information that does not necessarily mean health. And there's restrictions around that, too. So we have to do we have to do a number because we work globally. We have to do a number of follow a number of regulations that a lot involve kind of stripping out any type of personal information over time, whether we replace that with hashing or tokens, uh, de-identifying it, or just taking that data out of our out of our, um, our, ski, our our databases in general, just to cleanse the data. So there's that level of aspects, and that's more regulation driven around sensitive information being shared. Now, I think on the flip side of that, you have a few very complex issues associated with clinical research data in general, right? I think the industry in general has been proliferating pace where you have a ton of vendors under each type of data capture. So clinical data capture has you know, hundreds of different vendors on it. And obviously across different therapeutic areas, you can have hundreds of different types of data in any one clinical data capture system, right? Then, you know, operational data has traditionally captured in, in repositories like CTMS, clinical trial management systems. And most of those are homegrown. Now we're seeing an emergence of commercial systems for that, but many of them were homegrown inside a CRO or inside a sponsor, et cetera. And so with, with those challenges comes the idea that two CTMS or two data caps, clinical data capture systems, they, they could be almost as different as, you know, uh, as different as a, as a banana is to a, a steak, right? But inherently, you need to be able to identify what type of rows, what type of columns map generally to the same area. And so I think harmonization on data mapping has been a core, core kind of competency of Locavant. And, and, and even that by itself becomes an offering itself, right? So we use it to map the data to allow us to get into a standard format to make it available to analytics. And the reason we, you know, it's kind of like a lead in user innovation because the reason we did that ourselves is because analytics are only as powerful as the data you can, the data that they can consume in, in a standard form, right? And most systems, most analytics providers out there oftentimes will just say, I want to use it. I'm an analytics provider. Give me your data. I'm going to run analytics on it. And only 15% of that data or 20% of that data is standardized. So not surprisingly, you only get 15 or 20% of the value. Now, if you actually approach it from the perspective that you're an analytics provider um, and you recognize that the data is disparate and clinical research data is exceptionally disparate, it, 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 very few standards exist today. There are some, but very few. Um, then you have to think about the problem differently. And you have to say, okay, if I'm going to be have valuable output to my analytics, it's not actually an analytical problem at the outset, it's a data problem. And so we've spent, in fact, developed model-based methods, as I mentioned before, to map that data, to cleanse that data, to make it ready for analytics. And I think that is one of the biggest differentiators with Locavant out there, is that we don't think of the problem as purely an analytics problem. Yes, there are challenges with analytics, but most of the challenges come from the state of the data and how to actually get that data into a form that can be acted upon and can drive actions, drive human actions on trials to improve outcomes of pharmaceutical and therapeutics development. So clearly Locavant are identifying a, a unique opportunity in this space, which will have uh, benefits to uh, the, the entire industry long term but focusing on the here and now and the particular disruption that we're dealing with with the pandemic could you speak a little bit to how yeah, Locavant as a business are able to offer some unique solutions 
Yeah, it's, uh, it's top of mind, as, is, as I'm sure it is for most of the listeners out there as well, in terms of what's going on with the pandemic. Before we even talk about the pandemic in relation to local events business, I think it's fair to say that everything is disrupted. Everybody's life globally is disrupted from the pandemic. And not surprisingly, that also permeates down to clinical trials. Clinical trials are disrupted. Um, uh, patients in some, in some in arenas, sites are shut down. So patients can't continue the trials. In some situations, there's actually a lot of sites are up and seeing patients that need particular experimental therapeutics or any other type of healthcare needs as well, especially given the pandemic. And um, the practices associated with ensuring that trial sites are managed efficiently are not there. Monitoring, for example, can't happen in person anymore. So there's a wide, wide scale disruption. What's interesting about this is while we created a technology platform that allows a transformation of how trials are executed, administered and executed, right, using data, leveraging data, leveraging analytics, um, what we realized, especially given the pandemic, is we're uniquely positioned to predict, flag, and mitigate risks caused or exacerbated by the pandemic including challenges in activating and reactivating interrupted trials. And to that end, we're working with a number of different pharmaceutical sponsors and, and CROs as well to address trials that have been disrupted. Um, in addition, I'll just mention that we're working with a particular biotech that is um, developing a therapeutic for COVID-19 um, and as you can imagine, the critical aspects of getting this scaled up quickly, um, it was extremely paramount because the need is now. And most deployments in the clinical research world, they can take upwards of three to six months before you get a vendor on board to manage the data management and technology of the trial. We mobilized in two to four weeks and got the first patient in within 35 days of actually incepting the whole concept of the trial, which is relatively unheard of. So we're seeing actually a lot of need for our particular technology offering right now, given the pandemic. And interestingly enough, that has lead, led to a situation where Locavand is actually growing um, as an organization at a time where I think economics can be crippling for many organizations. So we've been growing at quite a pace recently to address the needs of all the different customers requiring next generation remote monitoring services on their trials, um, both from a pharma sponsor side, a CRO side, as well as a lot of partners out there that are working on trials that need such technologies to, to, to to, to be compatible with the current environment associated in trials. Rohit, got to be incredibly exciting times for you with the recent launch of the business and being able to impact not just right now with, with COVID, but also uh, long term with the impact you're, you're going to have on, on clinical trials and healthcare as a whole. What, what have you loved most about the journey thus far? I, I have to say I'm, I've never had more fun in, in terms of a, a work engagement um, you know, I was a data scientist for a while when I was in neuroscience and uh, computational neuroscience. Um, I'm a product person by industry training, and really, Locavent has allowed me to kind of wear both hats at the same time because we're a product company where data science is a substrate, and um, kind of take on. I can wear a number of hats because we have to run commercial, we have to run marketing, we have to run, and, and it's interesting in a, in a industry where traditionally in healthcare services companies are, predo are predominantly the type of companies you see because it's very hard to carve out a scalable product. Um, marketing has been a, a very interesting challenge there because in a product company, you have to say no to some feature requests by customers. Whereas that's just relatively unheard of in most healthcare companies because they're service companies. So, you know, in terms of in terms of what I love, I love every day. Even though nowadays we can't go into the office, I've even seen the team rise to the occasion where we're where we're actually hitting all our milestones early. Even though we're in in disparate you know distant locations, some of us now have gone back to our 
home countries as well. We're not all co-located even in the U.S. anymore, but everybody's rising to the occasion, working collaboratively across different departments, across different areas of exper expertise to make sure we can continue to deliver to the clinical research industry at a time that it needs this type of technology the most. And so I've been ex extremely fortunate not only to be leading a company, but to collaborate with all these incredible people. Um, so I think there's not one specific thing, but every day I, I enjoy my, my role more and more. Final question, Rohit. As, as we enter the world of what will be the new normal post-COVID and, and who knows when we're going to get back to uh, all in office um, together, once things settle down and you've got a, a, a bit better understanding of, of what the next two to three years are, look like, are going to look like for you guys, how big are you going to grow? How, you know, how big can this thing get? And, and as you build out a, a data team, what, what people will you be looking for to help you along this journey? Well, I will say that we're very much focused on organic growth. We're just this little shy of 30 people right now. And just to give you some indication of where we were last year, we were, you know, early last year, we were two people, right? So, so we are growing quickly. Um, I think the opportunity for us to get large quite quickly is there, especially given the current environment and what our product and technology offering provides to the clinical research community at a time when it needs it. It would be probably imprudent for me to speculate about how large we'll, we're going to get, but I, I definitely think that over the next year, we could see a doubling in size based on organic growth. In, re in relation to um, the question on the data team, well, I think it's obviously, we're a data science substrate product company, so I would say that it is the backbone of how we, how we develop. We have a data engineering team. We have a data science team. Um, and even our front end team is very focused on data visualization. So there's a strong data competency there. Um, and our design team is focused on data visualization folks on our design team. So if you want to think about it broadly, every, every member of our technology team is, has some focus on, on data in, in their day-to-day -day work. But I will say that in our data engineering team, we're growing that team right now. We're looking for um, particularly folks that have experience in enterprise data management because, let's face it, most of the customers we work with just uh, are using kind of more traditional enterprise data management approaches. We want to be more modular than that, but we need to understand our customers' um, our customers' uh, ways of working to be successful. Number one, and then we're you know as we expand. In data science, we have a pretty lean data science team now, but we anticipate over the next uh, 12 months that we'll be growing that team significantly as well with a new head of data science coming in who is a, uh, is a professor currently at Harvard Medical School. So we're very fortunate to have somebody who's um, you know, at the top of their game in the data science community coming to help us grow that team as well. Amazing. Well, Roy, thank you again for this. It, it's been very interesting to hear what you guys are working on and, and the impact it's had already. And, you know, from, from the explanation of the, of the market, it, it's clear that you guys are poised to have a huge impact. I'm really excited to see you grow and, and, and continue to be successful. So thank you again for your time. Thanks, JP. AI Action is brought to you by Aldus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Aldus offer an exec search program. Aldus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. Get the Aldus advantage. Become a member of the Aldus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to all its members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.